Right, so today's session, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Tan Lee Li and Ilin Guan. They will be on our expert panels. I will leave some time in at the uh, just before you know we get into the panel discussion for them to do a bit of self introduction. But as you can see here, um, Tan Lee Li, director with SBA Stone Forest, also a very, very seasoned professional, accounting professional. Ilin Guan, head of the Youth Wing Singapore China Association as well as a committee member of the Guangdong Hui Guan in Singapore. All right? So both of them are actually very well versed in uh, both in youth topics, entrepreneurship, as well as the China market. With that welcome, um, both of them, thank you for joining us today and agreeing to be our expert panels. Uh, Jermaine Tay, the co-founder at Expert, she will be giving delivering her, her session or her her, her presentation uh, immediately. So I'm just going to hand this over to Jermaine. All right, Jermaine, you're online? Can't see you. Yep, yep, I'm online. All right, okay, I'm going to stop this. So Jermaine, you can share your presentation now. Right. Okay, cool. All right, so uh, can you guys see my screen? Yep, we are seeing your screen. Okay, okay, great, yeah. all right. So hi everyone, uh, I'm Jermaine and thank you OSG for having me here today to share about my personal experience. So the topic for today's presentation is actually called uh, Move Fast and Break Things. So why did I choose this topic? It's because it's something that I resonate quite uh, closely with. And for those of you who are familiar with this, it's actually introduced by Mark Zuckerberg uh, back then and it was a very popular mantra in Silicon Valley. So in the tech context, it basically means that um, you have to constantly iterate and move fast in order for you to in, uh, come up with new product innovations. And when you break things, that's actually a good sign that you're moving fast enough so that you can do that. And on a personal level, how I relate to it is because I have to constantly keep trying, make mistakes, fix those mistakes, and that really summarizes my learning journey and how it brought me to where I am today. So uh, this is just a little background about myself. So I'm currently a co-founder at Expert, and it's a media agency that's based in Shenzhen. And at the same time, I'm also an adjunct teaching mentor in Singapore Management University. So I'm actually mentoring for a module called Digital Marketing, which allows me to do this digitally so I can manage like both things at the same time. And my career experience uh, really is it's, uh, 3.5 years in the greater China market, um, 2.5 years in Facebook as an account manager. And prior to that, I was an intern at Twitter, also serving the greater China market. So uh, I graduated from SMU in 2017. And prior to that, I was studying international business at Nian Polytechnic. So outside of work, I also do a lot of yoga. So um, I want to share with you guys about my experience working with Greater China Market simply because uh, in my entire corporate journey, I've, act I've actually not worked in a team full of Singaporeans. So I've, I was always the only Singaporean in the team. So here's uh, two group photos that uh, my team took. In 2017, when I first joined, I was the only Singaporean in a team full of uh, 13 people, or all from like Greater China Market, Hong Kong, Taiwan, and China. And fast forward to 2019, the team has grown to a size of 40 people, but I was still the only Singaporean, and until only recently they hired a Singaporean. So why I chose to share this experience is because um, I'm always kind of like the odd one out in, in like the corporate world, especially like in my team. And you know, as Singaporeans, we don't really have an advantage in terms of like our language capabilities because our English is like Singlish and Chinese is also kind of like Fan Tong Sui. So um, I struggled quite a bit when I joined this, when I joined a company because I couldn't really express myself as confidently as I thought I would in English. And also speaking with a group of native speakers just made me feel more inferior when I was like pitching to my clients or just simply sharing my ideas in a boardroom filled with people who are native speakers. So I worked really hard at the beginning. The first few months I had like dual screens and I had to reference like the English interface and Chinese interface of everything that I was reading and also just very determined to brush up on my Mandarin because I wanted to be confident in the way I carry myself. And um, a pivotal moment for me was when I felt like I could pitch and present to clients more confidently in a wide group of audiences. And I also try to take, more, take on more opportunities to pitch to, um, or to present when, when there's a chance. So gradually I felt more confident and I thought that, okay, if I set my mind to do something and I'm committed to it, one day I can eventually like get there. So I wanted to challenge myself further. And this is why Expert was founded last year when I left Facebook in May and I moved to Shenzhen. I remember the very same weekend that I left the company so what Expert does, uh, essentially like we are a media agency that 
focuses a lot on Facebook advertising. By helping e-commerce businesses to build global brands and scale their ads through advertising technology. So uh, this is a picture of my co-founder who is also from Facebook. And um, when we first moved to Shenzhen, we had to take on more speaking opportunities just to build our brand presence and you know, like share, share with everyone that we are there in the market and also try to get clients. Although we do have um, a reputation built because we are both from Facebook and we kind of know like partners in the market as well. So that made things a little bit easier. Uh, and here's a photo of uh, EDB, ESG, and IMD visiting us at our office. And this was our team when we first started. So uh, these are my two interns from NUS, from the NOC program. And we, this is a picture of us in Guilin during the National Golden Week in China, which uh, is a one week of holiday. So we brought them there to like work and play at the same time. So how was it like transitioning from Facebook and then eventually starting my own company? So this was the reaction when I told everyone that I was going to leave Facebook. Like, I was like, oh, are you, are you crazy or out of your mind? Like, why would you want to leave such a prestigious job? You know, everyone's like trying so hard to get to your position. And here you are just leaving after 2.5 years. And what more, I told them, okay, I'm going to start my own company. So everyone's like, oh, okay. So you're going to leave Facebook and start your own company. Like, tell me more about this brilliant opportunity that you, you have. Then lastly, I told them, okay, I'm going to leave Facebook, start my own company and move to China. So everyone's reaction at this point was like, oh, you must be out of your mind, you know? Like, why would you want to do that? It's a very stable job at Facebook, yet you tell me you're going to start your own company and moving to China. Like, all of it just sounded really crazy to the normal human being. But uh, despite all odds, I decided that, uh, I mean, we have had a lot of time just sitting down and planning for our business and thinking whether this would work out. And at the end of the day, like, we decided if... Um, this is not the right time to do it then when we just wanted to put our Facebook knowledge to, to practice and if we were to leave Facebook we would probably join another company another tech company and we have to start from scratch so why don't we use our face, current Facebook knowledge to put it into practice by actually starting an agency to fill a huge gap that we've seen in the China market so um, just to share a couple of reasons as to why I decided to leave Facebook which is deemed as like the dream company it, it definitely took a lot of courage for me to send in my resignation email uh, to my manager then. Um, and despite everyone saying that I shouldn't do it, I, I did it eventually. Mainly also because I had a lot of support from my current co-founder, who's also my boyfriend. So um, I think a lot of push factors for me to leave the company then was because I didn't have any job satisfaction from what I was doing. I was there for two and a half years and just simply doing the same thing repetitively, repetitively every day was something that um, I, I didn't find joy anymore. Although I did try to uh, initiate like new projects, try to do new things, but essentially my job scope and my requirements um, were the same. It didn't change. And yes, working at Facebook is, is such a sweet job, right? Like you have such great welfare, everything is provided for, uh, such awesome food and pantry selection, but there was still that one thing that was lacking. And eventually that's actually that self-actualization that we really, we, we kind of need, you know, like, in the hierarchy of needs where you kind of have all that basic needs fulfilled, you just need to get there. Like, and, and that is derived through working in a role that I would thoroughly enjoy. And the second push factor for me was because I disliked working in a nine to five job, like the same nine to five routine where I have to constantly like hustle and grind every day. Although at Facebook, it's never a nine to five, it's like nine to midnight or something because you are working in a greater China team. So you, that culture is not even defined by how Facebook is like Facebook is a Western company, but working in a greater China team is just a very Asian mentality where everyone has to like work hard, work overtime just to get things done. So over time, it also it got, I mean, it took a toll on me, it took a toll on my health. And eventually I was just thinking whether this is really what I want. Um, and then this leads me to how we started thinking about our business idea, how we wanted to leave the company and perhaps like leave the country to live abroad, work overseas to gain that overseas exposure and also starting our own business because this would fulfill all things that I wanted, uh, which is to lead a digital nomad life some point in my life. So uh, some people also ask like, okay, why did you decide to like start your company in Greater China and not Singapore? Uh, I know like everyone's talking about how China is like a powerhouse and, and like it's a place to be. And also there are lots of risks um, starting a business in China. But uh, I mean, I did an internship in Shanghai way back in 2013. And this also kind of affirmed why I enjoy working in China simply because of all the technological advancements. And there's just so many more things you're exposed to, so much more learning that you don't really get here in Singapore. 
And also because like um, of all the experience that I've built up along the way, I just wanted to deepen my knowledge by being there in China. So um, here are three short stories that I want to share with everyone with regards to like my topic today, which is move fast and break things. First of all, it's uh, diversifying business models. So why, why would I say that? It's because um, when we first moved to China, all things that we initially thought out of, of doing did not actually uh, work out. So uh, one example is we initially thought we wanted to just be consultants to like Chinese companies because wow, we come from Facebook, right? Everyone will listen to us. Everyone will pay us to give us like one hour of consultation time. But that is absolutely not true at all. When we told our clients, okay, this is our service offering. And then they are like, oh, why don't I just give you money and you do it for yourself? But that was not what we intended to do because we wanted um, a very low touch model where we just talk to clients and then they can settle it themselves. So eventually we realized that that is not uh, a, a service that these Chinese clients want. They want to pay us and they want us to execute it as well. But we're only a team of two people. How can we manage like so many clients or how can we scale if we don't think of how to make it into a streamlined process? So gradually we decided to like diversify our business model a little bit by actually doing a little bit of hands-on work. But we were also very selective of the clients that we pick at the beginning. So we make sure that we, that the client has potential to scale in, the, uh, in global markets. And from there, once we build our brands, we'll get more clients in and that's when we can kind of streamline our operations. So through that, we also realized that uh, crowdfunding is actually a very big thing in Shenzhen because everyone's like manufacturing in Shenzhen, but there's no way to bring this product overseas. And the best way to do it is through Facebook advertising and through crowdfunding platforms such as Kickstarter and Indiegogo, which then um, got us thinking like whether we should actually have another business unit just focusing on crowdfunding itself. And that's when we partnered with a former Kickstarter employee to start our next uh, business unit, which is focusing on full service crowdfunding um, offering. And then through that process, we also realized that there's actually some limitations that uh, these platforms uh, have. So what we did was to actually form another team. And this is our group of NUS interns uh, and NUS like project mates where, where they're our engineers to help build, build a SaaS tool for us to um, make our entire process advertising on Facebook and Kickstarter more efficiently. So the second story, uh, like living in China and also working there is that we have to observe, learn and adapt to the business culture and nuances there. So um, we, we are actually scammed on, a multi on multiple occasions uh, simply because like, I think we are still new to this and we, we thought that having a contract in place, having a signed contract in place would kind of protect us uh, against like all odds, right? Like if anything goes wrong, we just revert back to the contract, but that is absolutely not true because um, I mean, on top of like our business, um, like contracts with clients where sometimes clients would renegotiate terms that have already been signed and once we execute the work fully they said that they are not going to pay us for all the things that we did so at, at the beginning i thought it was quite strange that chinese clients don't really abide to like contracts and if there's anything they just say oh, okay i'll get my lawyer to like sue you and of course as fresh grads or like um young youngsters in the workforce we were quite shocked but I guess we start to learn and we learn how to maneuver through such situations and also this um this is another story that I want to share with you guys uh, because we actually rented an office before we got to Shenzhen. So everything that was detailed in the contract was not delivered when we moved to the office. For example, simple things like uh, having even floors, having non-leaking air conditioning, having um, like a conducive workplace, workplace to work at was just not fulfilled. So uh, we sneakily like left the office overnight, although we did kind of have uh, like contractual terms all terminated with the landlord. But it was just an experience like how we can never trust things that are documented in black and white and we have to be so cautious about the things that we're doing. So this is a picture of uh, me and my interns just moving office overnight, settling into our new space. And we also put up a couple of Facebook posters there, posters there just so that we could feel like closer to home. So the last thing that actually I want to talk about is how we have to rethink our business operations. Because in a time like this, I'm sure everyone can resonate, like COVID has really digitally transformed so many companies. And this is just a tweet that I found really funny because who led the digital transformation of your company? It's none other, your CEO, CTO, but it's actually COVID. So COVID has made us think more positively uh, about our current situation because um, since we bought a ticket back from Shenzhen in January, I, I never thought I would not go back. So throughout this period, we actually moved all our things out from our office virtually through a, through a mover that we engage. And we are in the midst of like moving our things back because COVID has made us think of how to streamline our processes and how to make 
our entire business operations so lean such that we don't have to be based in China anymore and we can actually operate out of Singapore. So I, I think all of this like really made us think on our feet and how we could adapt to changing circumstances. So in a nutshell, like the message or that one takeaway I want to share with everyone is to keep trying, make mistakes and to fix those mistakes because all of this uh, sum up into your learning journey and one day when you look back, everything will kind of make sense as they fall into place. Yeah. So uh, this is my sharing so far and if you have any questions, feel free to ask me and I'll be sure to elaborate on them. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jermaine. That was a very interesting, um, let me just pick it over. All right, that was very interesting um, how you were sneaking out of your own office in the middle of the night. Okay, and I think you will be grateful that that was happening in China and not in you know, some Western country, otherwise you probably get shot for leaving, moving your computers and things like that out, you know. So, um, all right, we will, you know, this is not, I'm sharing my screen, right? Okay. All right, so um, we will go into the panel discussion very, very shortly. So if I may, uh, Tan Lili, Ms. Tan Lili, Ms. Elin Guan, uh, if I may invite you to do a bit of self-introduction as well as to share your own experience. Take a couple of minutes each to just mingle with the client, or client, the audience, sorry, <laughs> and Jermaine, all right? And then we can go into the um, exchange session. Uh, you, Lily, you want to go first? Yes, okay, I can go first. Uh, um, can, can you see me or, or not? Yeah, we can okay, see hi. you now. Okay, hi. Hi, everyone. My name is Lily. Uh, just a quick introduction. Um, uh, I'm, I'm a Singaporean and I've been, um, I came to China in the year of 2005. So I've been in, um, I, I'm mainly based in Shanghai through these 19 years. And I came as an accountant. I was previously from a big four and uh, I was um, with a big four uh, in my earlier years when I was in China. Um, the last, I spent my last nine years uh, managing a, bis a CPA business in, um, in, in Shanghai. We are headquarters in Shanghai. SBS Stone Forest is actually a CPA, a Singapore-based CPA firm, but this subsidiary is uh, based in Shanghai, and we have um, uh, offices in uh, five other cities uh, throughout China. Now, um, I'm, I'm so happy to be here today, and I wish I was um, as young as Jermaine when I first came to China. Um, obviously, uh, I, I, mean, I spent a fair bit of time um, working and, of course, enjoying my myself in, in Shanghai and around the other uh, cities and going to, to, to the uh, mountains and I do a lot of running uh, as well yeah so thank you <laughs> thank you Lily for sharing uh, Elaine uh, hi everyone yes. yes hi my name is Elaine um, I'm a Singaporean I used to work or uh, rather I used to represent Taising Media in Beijing so I travel a lot to Beijing um, and after that, I joined a uh, Singapore SME. So I also travel a lot to to China, Chongqing. Um, basically, is to bring Singapore companies who want to venture into China. So that is part of what I have been doing for the past few years. Um, even currently, uh, professionally, I'm with SBF. So I'm actually helping them to bring companies overseas, especially to the China and North Asia market. Uh, today, I'll be representing Singapore China Association, which is a non-profit organization registered in Singapore. We aim to promote uh, business and cultural exchanges between Singapore and China. So if anyone is keen, please feel free to look me up. I can share more with you. So I'm very happy today to be able to talk to Jermaine. If, if I'm at Jermaine's age, right, I hope I, I had the same determination as her to actually venture, give up, I wouldn't say give up everything, but to really change your own lifestyle, change um, your own, and to chase your own dreams, basically. Thank you. Thank you, Eileen. All right, so great introduction. So let's just start off. Uh, well, I do have a question actually posted on uh, from uh, in, in the Zoom chat. So let me just start off with this first, right? And then after that, Lily and uh, Eileen, y'all can start sharing with Jermaine as well. So uh, Cordelia Tan, Cordelia Tan's interested to know, having newly moved to Shenzhen, how do you actually get to know all the players, in, all the people, all your clients, like your first contract, everything in Shenzhen, having not knowing anybody here. 
Maybe you would like to share on that, share, share with us that first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we get this of, uh, question quite often. So basically, before we move to China, of course, we have to make sure that uh, some of our clients or like the key stakeholders already know that this is going to happen because people would assume that we are a Facebook direct competitor, but we are not because we're an agency and Facebook is a platform. So by us moving to China, actually, we are helping Facebook grow their presence in China, which means increased revenue in China, right? And that's when we, we kind of inform everyone and we make sure that there's a need for our services because Facebook is actually not allowed in China and these um, advertisers have to use VPN to get to Facebook. So all of our partners are really new and that kind of helped build our reputation and presence in China a little bit when we secured our first contract. Although just now I did share that what we originally wanted to sell was not what they wanted. They wanted us to execute what we are sharing with them. Yeah. So that was just a little change in our business model. Literally telling you I have money. Try to service yes. me. Yes. Ch Chinese clients have a lot of money when it comes to advertising dollars, but you need to know what they want so that you can like, you know, yeah, provide them good, with, good. with good results, yeah. Very good. Well, Lily and Eileen, now over to you girls and um, fire away your questions. So I actually okay. want to tap on the previous question. Um, mm. Since we all know about the great firewall of China, so why do you still choose to go into China for Facebook marketing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, good question, because a lot of uh, people know that Facebook is actually not allowed in China, and this is precisely why we have to be there. Because of the fact that P Facebook is so inaccessible to these Chinese advertisers means that there's a huge, huge market uh, gap and opportunity for us, simply because, uh, first of all, like we come from the platform, so we have a very rich knowledge in terms of how it works. And we also kind of want to help these China advertisers get more access to Facebook uh, resources and support. So by us being there, um, what, what these Chinese advertisers do is, even though they use VPN to use Facebook, right, but their main objective is really to reach out to international audiences. This is why they are on Facebook. Yeah. I see. Lily, would okay. you like to ask? Hi, yeah. Yeah, I'll ask the next question. Hi, hi, Jermaine. Okay, I, I, I'm an accountant by practice, so I'm going to ask you some business questions about how you get started. Now, mm -hmm. um, startup face a lot of hurdles when they first kick off their business, among which are, for example, manpower, business ideas, and of course, the most important question is funding. Can you share with us how did you go about gathering your business resources, in particular, your capital and how long did it take you to put them together yeah 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 so um we actually bootstrap our entire like business because as an agency we don't really have a lot of upfront costs that we have to incur like in terms of operating expenses it's quite low we just have to pay for like our rent our like interns for example and then of course like we did talk to a couple of vcs at the beginning but we wanted to not be influenced by all the like kpis or expectations that the VC, vcs have on us and wanted to adopt mm. a more slow and steady approach because ultimately starting this business is more of like a self-pursuit and we want to take this time to enjoy and explore like different business models or business ideas that we have and not be influenced by all these external factors. Cool. So okay, tapping, on, yeah, tapping on Lily's question, right? So being a female entrepreneur, since mm -hmm. we are all females on the panelists here today. So maybe you can share with us some of the challenges that you face um, as a female entrepreneur and how mm -hmm. you eventually overcome them. Mm. Um, honestly, I, I didn't think I faced a lot of issues with regards to like, me being a female. Uh, or maybe I, I just wasn't sensitive to that. But I think one, one thing I felt more was um, because my, like I showed earlier in one of the pictures, our, one of our partners for crowdfunding is actually uh, Caucasian. He's Dutch. So usually when we go for our client meetings or even when we follow up with clients, right, at the end of the day, the clients disregard my opinions simply because I'm like Asian or maybe I'm Chinese. Um, but they would rather hear my partner's opinion and we have equal stakes in the business and we come from like different platforms. So we are sharing different platform experience. But at the end of the day, when it comes to decision making or like uh, just influencing what they think, they would rather hear my, my Caucasian partner's opinions instead of mine. So um, at some point, I was just like, okay, uh, I mean, I, I didn't let that like affect me or anything, but we just felt like if he's the one who can kind of move the needle and get the contract signed, then why not just go ahead and do it, you know? So I didn't really let the fact that I'm female affect how I work or how I present myself. Or maybe you can share with us some, some tips to, because mm -hmm. for you yourself is 
um, how you view it is it's your business as well. So anybody mm-hmm. who can help you clinch the contract, uh, mm-hmm. you'll be happy to take a back seat. Mm-hmm. So how about um, our young entrepreneurs friends out there? Mm-hmm. Um, okay, I mean, I, I don't really know if I can share like good tips about this because I have never let the fact that I'm female affect or stop me from doing what I want to do. I guess I was just very fixated with um, my goals and how I can carry that out. And I didn't let that affect me simply because I don't think I was capable enough as compared to like my male counterpart, for example. So yeah, I feel like once you have enough confidence, you can just like achieve what you want to do. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. It's not such a bad thing, actually, I think, you know, it, I, I really think it's not such a bad thing to, to actually be um, on the back seat, kind of like, you know, the term, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> You know, most, most of the, the, the most successful men or businesses or whatever, all, all these people actually have someone behind them that gives them this support. And most of the time, I think these people behind actually give them the real idea because these people are not actually not involved with all the, you know, dealing with the client or the clients are not dealing with them. You know, you're able to see things more objectively and actually, you know, because the client's not willing to deal with you, sometimes you're able to see it really, I think, more objectively rather than getting so emotionally attached, saying, oh, but the client really liked me, you know, always asking me out, you know, that kind of thing. And kind of, I think it's a good thing. <laughs> it's a great thing, actually. All right. Do we have any other um, questions for Jermaine? I think um, um, we oops, do have sorry. a question from Shalom or Lily and Eileen. Do you all still have anything that you all want to discuss? Uh, I yes, I, 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 I can ask a question. I, I think yes. someone else, um, an audience, uh, have a question. Oh, uh, yeah. I just thought this whole topic of being like a young female entrepreneur, quite interesting um, topic. And I was just wondering, of course, if you have the possibility of kind of taking the backseat and let another person to do it who can, so, so to say, in our society, do a better job and, you know, reaching the goal and getting the thing done, that's fine. But I think in a lot of cases where you're an entrepreneur and you're kind of on your own and you represent your company and there's no backseat to fall behind to, if there's any solution for that or any kind of strategy to work with it, if that makes mm-hmm. sense. <laughs> yeah, I guess um, that, that's when you kind of have to rely on like a team effort, right? So really depending on what kind of skill sets or, or like your strengths and weaknesses, I guess like you have to hire a team of people that could kind of complement your strengths and weaknesses. So just like me and my co-founder or even like my team of interns, um, we hire people that uh, we know we are not, we, we are lacking in that skill set, for example, like all the people that I hire are engineers. And because that's simply something that I cannot do at all. And for example, like me and my co-founder, we kind of complement each other in terms of our knowledge about the market and in terms of our strengths and weaknesses. So I guess like in scenarios where you don't really have anyone that you can fall back on, that's when you have a team of people that can help you with whatever you're struggling with. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Oh, am I you. on mute? Okay, yeah. All right, there, there is a couple of questions that I think I, I might be able to just answer. Um, you know, Shalom is asking, are you looking to expand into other cities like Shanghai? Elvina mm-hmm. Ong is asking, why did you choose to be based in Shenzhen? Well, I, I think for her to be expanding into other cities like Shanghai, like Jermaine said, she's really looking more for a nomadic lifestyle and I think she's actually not so concerned about where she's based. She, she, she really took this COVID-19 I think as a very positive uh, influence on her decision. Of course, as with her co-founder, right, made the, uh, a co-decision that they don't need to be physically based anywhere in their kind of service. You know, very lucky for you. I mean, I'm in a construction business so I can't I can't just say, yeah, I want to build something there, but I, 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 I don't need to be there. My workers can do it virtually. So 
you know, I, I really can't do things like that. And I envy you guys, you know, in technology where you can actually base yourself out of anywhere to do work, you know. Um, so choosing yourself to be based in Shenzhen, of course, was from your experience in um, Hong Kong and South China market. So you, you have existing contacts or rather your co-founder had existing uh, resources that you guys could tap on. So I think that's very smart to actually come into Shenzhen. Plus, Shenzhen has very similar food cultures and weather compared to Singapore. So it doesn't really make you feel like you are overseas or, you know, it, it's close to home, but you know, you are not restricted by all those um, restrictions in Singapore. Um, right, let's see. And okay, Alvina all actually asked, uh, I, I think that's quite an interesting question as well. And I would like to hear from you. How did you know there's a demand for the service you're offering? And did you perform any market research? Uh, for, I mean, you were in Facebook and you know that there's a market, but how did you actually know that this market was sustainable enough that you said, nobody's doing it, I want to tap on the whole thing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So we actually spoke to many clients and including friends in the market to see what kind of uh, service offering would be most attractive to like advertisers, which is our main target audience. Uh, and also kind of fine-tune our service quite a bit, especially since we were struggling with how to price our products. Like coming from, I mean, Facebook, like you would think that with such branding, people would actually like rush to like buy or engage your services, but actually that was not the case for us. And to be honest, at the very beginning, we were quite lost and wondering if it was the right move for us. And even like what was going on with our service offering, like it was just, um, it really took us a lot of time talking to different clients, in fact, like talking to the same client many times just to find out like what he or she is looking for. And finally, we kind of found a sweet spot to price ourselves and to pitch our service offering to the people in the market. And hence, there's a demand now because of um, a couple of success cases that we did. We ran a few crowdfunding cases that had a million dollar, raised a million dollar in funding. So once you have one successful case, many more clients will start coming to you asking about uh, the previous cases that you did. And we also rely a lot on referrals. So that's how we can kind of work remotely here in Singapore now because we still have a constant like influx of client referrals and we're also basing it uh, like for a recurring clients deal as well. Good, good. Thank you. All right, uh, let me just ask another more business oriented question. Uh, Cordelia Tan, was asking, now that you're back in Singapore, would you be considering uh, catering to the Singapore market as well? If you do, what are the key differences? And if not, why not? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I honest, Okay, so many of uh, my friends or like uh, advertisers especially ask whether we are keen to work on other markets. But at this point of time, no, because um, the nature of like Singapore market versus China, it's, it's very different. Um, simply because, okay, at least for Chinese advertisers, what we want to do is really like direct to consumer brands. We work with traditional um, Chinese clients or manufacturers who have completely no digital marketing knowledge or have completely no knowledge of what Facebook is all about. And we help them really to build, take, to take a product to market. So we help them to build a brand and we kind of rebrand that to be suitable for international markets. And we also have I have some Singaporean friends who asked if we could help with their digital marketing plans, but at least for now, our main aim is really to help um, traditional businesses or like manufacturers to take their products overseas. Yeah. What I'm hearing you saying is, very, uh, <clears throat> what I'm hearing you saying is, is uh, the market in Singapore probably is mature and the Chinese clients are actually more receptive to your services more or your suggestion because maybe Singapore mm -hmm. companies are so well versed in technology and Facebook that they think they know better than you. <laughs> yeah and, and actually um, yeah and also because the Singaporean market right the size is so small that advertising within Singapore is not as challenging as, as advertising for global markets so that's where we want to position ourselves. Mm. Mm. All right okay Okay, so, all right, how do you actually overcome? I mean, you had your friends, your parents <coughs> asking you not to set up, not to quit your job, you know? So I'm going a little bit more into the personal realm, okay? So how did you, 
how did you overcome that? How did you say no? Or did you grow up just saying no to your parents all the time? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so um, when we decided to take this move to like move to China, there were a lot of convincing that needed to be done. So I remember like coming up with business plans and presenting it to our parents to show that this business would be like financially stable and it will take off uh, at the end of the day. So um, I guess we kind of proved it through our hard work and through like successful cases proving to people that this is something that can be done and not let them affect us. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Hey, Eileen, Lily, what do you think about her being young, you know, or she's at the age of re- re- rebellious uh, nature? Like Eileen was saying, I wish I was like you, you know, I could say no to my parents and just fly somewhere with my boyfriend and start a company. <laughs> <laughs> I actually wouldn't say that she's rebellious. I would say that she has a lot of drive and determination. That's just a nice way of saying. It is. Just a nice way of saying she's a rebel, right? <laughs> she no, knows actually, people, no people my parents. At, her at some point, she, they were quite supportive because I actually uh, got them to invite them to come to Shenzhen to see like my my business and like to see the office and everything. So they were quite comfortable with the idea of me being there. Yeah, I mean, although they are happy that I'm back now. <laughs> yeah, but they, uh, Jimmy, they can I ask you a question? They... Yeah, 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 please, Lily. Yeah, I, I want to ask you another money question. How long did mm-hmm. it take you money to question. earn your more your your tea tong jing, your mm-hmm. first pot of gold? I think uh, mm-hmm. I I think we have this burning question to to understand uh, if your business model works. Certainly, um, mm-hmm. and 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 what were the best. Uh, business decisions and uh, and your greatest achievement uh, in this journey as an entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was waiting yeah. for Lily to ask this question coming from. <laughs> <your next question. laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, let's just say I don't regret my decision leaving Facebook, and and also I, I don't think that we have done our tea tong jing yet because that's also quite relative, right? Um, we we are doing pretty well in terms of like the revenue that we are generating so just last month we actually hit uh, eight digits in terms of revenue but of course this really comes with us understanding our clients and their needs and how we can streamline our processes such that such a small team like this could operate so independently and with us being based in singapore um it's actually been pretty smooth so far and of course like how what what achievement um is that if if I still stayed at Facebook, I don't think we could have achieved what we have achieved like today. So um, we, we are still pretty unsure of whether the direction that we're heading towards is correct. But at least at this point in time, it's validated because the service that we're providing to our clients are actually seeing good returns. And the things that we're doing mm. are also having positive returns. So we will be continuing this for a while until we kind of like hit the next roadblock or, or have our next like planning as to like our future directions. Mm. So I think you just answered one of the questions. Somebody, what matrix do you use to measure success of a company? I think your company, if within a year you're hitting eight digits, I think that's quite comfortable, right? Yeah, and also um, initially when, when we set out to do this, like my co-founder and I, like we had this shared goal and that is to zuan qian. So we want to make sure that um, every client that we pick up, we know that they have potential to scale and not spend time on products that have a less likelihood of success when they go international. Mm. So we are very mm. selective for our portfolio of clients. And even though we have uh, 200 plus clients now, we only have high touch model with like the top 20% who give us like 80% of our revenue. So in terms mm. of the long tail clients, we do have our processes and, and parts to work with them. So we are not like talking to them every day, but rather we have a streamlined process to reach out to these clients. So if I may ask a question, I, I don't know, the, sorry, Lily, do, were you happy with her answer? <laughs> Are you yeah, happy actually with... I want to ask the eight digit is what currency? <laughs> uh, US. US, US dollar. dollar. Fantastic. Yeah. Well done, right. well done. I, I, I would like to come in now and ask one question. Uh, one, one question, because both of you, you and your co-founder or, or your, the, your, your partner are both from Facebook. How, how much of Facebook's um, influence on you guys have brought you all to where you are? Or would you have said, you know, Facebook was just a place that I meet my co-founder, but we, everything else was really from you guys? 
And how much of it was actually something that you took away from Facebook, that you learned from Facebook? Mm -hmm. That actually, because I, I think there's, there isn't a lot of um, stories like yours within a year and you are actually doing pretty well. All right. Uh, maybe I would even dare say it's a, it's above your expectations. Then, yeah. Right? Um, I would say, in fact, like I think all of this, like how we thought of this business idea, everything is because of my experience at Facebook. Because I was never ever exposed to the world of digital marketing, and I had no idea what advertising was. I had no idea like that there's actually this world of e-commerce where you can just run run a business like digitally. So Facebook definitely opened my eyes to ways I've never imagined and Facebook definitely gave us the platform knowledge, gave us the resources, gave us the branding and in fact like gave us some of our clients slash, slash friends because we're quite close to our clients and we still are very close to some of the people at Facebook because we work very closely with each other and they will still rely on us to provide some market feedback simply because China is like so out of reach and each time like they implement a new policy for example they will also check in with our team to find out if it's resonating well with the advertisers in the market. So we still maintain a very close working relationship with our counterparts at Facebook and also our clients in the market. Yeah. All right. All right. Let's see some of the questions. Um, I think the audience have quite a number of questions. Uh, right. Let's see. What, uh, I'm, look at, I'm getting quite a bit of um, questions. Daphne. Daphne Tan mentioned that you are considering working out of Singapore in the future. Do you think that might affect, affect your sales since face-to-face -face interaction with clients and hunting mm -hmm. for new clients may still be important? Yeah, um, yeah I, I think it might. But uh, like I mentioned before, like we are relying a lot on referrals right now and also recurring clients. So we have secured quite a stable base. And I think if really need be, when the situation dies down, we can always still make a trip back. And we are also not really considering to be based out of Singapore for now because um, I've wanted to experience like living abroad and that overseas working experience. So I guess our next move would be um, being based out of Bangkok for like three months and also, I don't know, like see where it takes us. <laughs> to be honest, we are quite fluid with our plans because um, eventually at the end of the day, like we would still want to go back to the corporate world. Like this business is like a self-pursuit of really uh, trying our business idea, experiencing running our business ourselves. But at the end of the day, like, um, we still want to go back to the corporate world, yeah. And um, all right, Terence Tans have a question, and uh, I think Lily and and Elaine, you might be able to tap in on this as well. So, from Jermaine's point of view, um, well, Terence Tan is asking this question, and he, well, understanding Facebook is actually very global, but are your services actually better at targeting for your clients a specific market, like in the US or certain part of Europe? Um, actually, oh wait, sorry. Oh, our service is better at targeting. So number, actually, yeah. cause like Facebook advertising is pretty much, pretty much global. So we'll see where our clients' uh, products have a better product market fit. Although um, it's true that for most crowdfunding clients, we do advertise to US and Europe quite heavily. Mm -hmm. Because okay. that's where like most audiences are based at and there's a higher reach for these markets. So are you getting any inquiries about, oh, can you help market my things into Japan, Korea? you know, country, Asian countries. Yeah, for sure. But um, we, we actually do pretty much global. And I mean, because right now we can only speak English or like write English copywriting, right? So if there's a need for like Korean and Japan markets, we will hire native speakers to do uh, those markets. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Lily, Eileen, do you have anything to touch on this? No? No, I think, I think for Jermaine's team, right? What? is um, their unique selling point is also their understanding of the Chinese market. So because of that, they are able to act as a bridge between the Chinese market to their intended audience, which is the, the market in the US and in the Europe. That's my take. Yeah, am I right, Jermaine? Yeah. Right. Um, Janet Lim in the audience, I have a question. Is scaling ad expert on your roadmap? If so, by when? And how many times did you have to re pivot yourself to date? That means mm -hmm. realigning or mm. realigning yeah. your business model. Yeah. 
Yeah, so uh, we, we have already, I would say we've kind of like scaled our company such that it doesn't require my co-founder and myself to be based, uh, I mean, or like to be here physically or like to be anywhere to manage our employees. So it's kind of like self-sufficient where everyone's like kind of on autopilot. They know what to do because we've kind of operationalized everything. So like month on month, we are growing like by 30%. And it's, it's just showing that there's really a huge demand for our kinds of services in the market. So we are definitely still growing, scaling at this point. And we are, we basically for us, we are very focused on uh, coming out of processes. So eventually if one day, like my co-founder are no longer here, the business still can be running by itself. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. And um, Lily, the next question, Lily and Elena, the next question, I think y'all, I would appreciate your input as well, because y'all have came from um, MNC's background as well, right? Huge corporations. It's interesting because Jermaine, the idea that you and your co-founder had to, to actually implement it, if Facebook wanted to implement it, I think it would be very easy. So I'm asking actually this on behalf of KJ Lee, why didn't Facebook think of the idea that you had? Or mm -hmm. they had the idea and they were doing mm -hmm. it and you just found a gap that they were not covering? Or, mm -hmm. or you just yeah. saw business was spilling over and Facebook was not able to handle that many clients and you mm -hmm. went to pick up the crumbs? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So essentially, uh, companies like Facebook, Twitter, and Google, we are all, I mean, these companies are all operating on the same model where they are in the market, but they are not uh, operating like us as an agency. So as an agency, we have more specialized skill sets. We work more closely with the clients and we really provide like a step-by-step -step guide as to how they can like go global, for example. But because Facebook has 10,000 or 10 millions of clients, they cannot expect, or advertisers in that sense, they cannot expect to have such direct service with these advertisers. So here as an agency, what we are doing is to provide more specialized services and we really deep dive into each business needs rather than, uh, okay, if you face a problem today, you please go to Facebook chat support. Like you can never solve a problem with Facebook chat support, right? Yeah. So this is where like, agencies like us come into place to really understand your business needs and offer you a more tailored solution. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Yao Rong Cho Cho Yao Rong, right? Cho should be the last name, right? Cho Yao Rong. Uh, he's involved in doing an ad tech startup right now, and he's interested to understand what is your stance on using social media platform to improve teachers mm -hmm. and students' lives. Mm, yeah, and yeah. I mean, essentially, uh, everything on social. Once you're on social media, you can easily reach out to your target audience once you have found a niche and how you can market your products. In fact, back then when I was at um, Facebook, I did manage quite a few ad tech uh, clients based in Hong Kong. They're all uh, apps where students and teachers can connect through an app by asking questions and teachers can kind of help them with uh, whatever issues that they're facing in their studies. So I, I believe that if you're using social media for, for a good purpose or a positive force, one, one day you're brand will gain traction. So it really depends. So people often ask us like, how should I go my brand? Should it be organic or should I focus a lot on paid ads? But I think it's really a mixture of both because at some point you will still rely on ads to kind of grow your business presence. And once your business is taking off and it's viral, that's when you kind of reduce your ad spend and you rely a lot on organic growth. So I, I think like these two things come hand in hand, but at the end of the day, it's actually good to be, I mean, it's a good thing to be on social media. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. I think that answers most, all, quite a number of those questions. Okay, um, KJ Lee has another question. Uh, what do you think is the shelf life of your business idea? What factors would affect the longevity of your business? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, what would I actually think... stop your business in its tracks, I think? Mm. Yeah, I think one thing that uh, most people have also like talked to us about is like, what if one day um, no one advertises on Facebook or what if like Facebook is not operating anymore what if there's like the next big social media platform for example with the rise of TikTok um, maybe one day TikTok will take over like how Facebook how everyone's like so active on Facebook and it's true that um, there are more and more people who are not using Facebook anymore but there are also people in other parts of the world that are still very active on Facebook and there's still a growth in those markets so I guess like there really is no um, fixed answer to the shelf life of our business idea as long as Facebook is operating, yeah. Mm -hmm. So unless one day Facebook is deemed redundant or there's really another big social media giant that takes over, then 
that's when we kind of pivot. But the good thing now is also because we have very diversified business models. Like we have crowdfunding, we have the Facebook side of things, and also we are building our own SaaS tool. So no matter what, it also goes back to the earlier question and someone asked how many times have we tried to like, re-pivot to date. We are always thinking of new ideas. We are always kind of like uh, pivoting, but also still trying to get validation for our business idea before we invest more resources in that area. Yeah. All right. Thank you. And by the way, the Facebook users are, I think, called the baby boomers, right? <laughs> and then the younger generation, I think they look at Facebook, yee, so old school. <laughs> so you're still targeting the old, old people market. Lah. The engaged shoppers on Facebook. All right. Okay, let's see. <laughs> Spencer, oh, okay, J Janet Lim just, uh, just uh, corrected me, not exactly baby boomer, it's the Gen X and Gen Y. That use no, I know a lot of baby boomers that are using Facebook actually. <laughs> That's like their first thing. Like, oh, I'm very tech, I'm very technology savvy because I'm on Facebook, and they don't know anything else. You know. <laughs> All right. Um. Okay. Spencer has a question as well. Uh, what makes you seek out such an international experience? I mean, you know, when many Singaporeans prefer to stay in the comfort of home. What What do you think in your upbringing and your life journey? That mm -hmm. brought you to the point that you said, you know, I'm the only person, I'm the only Singaporean in a group of expat community or in China, and you're okay with it, and you're actively seeking out. I want to be in the international market. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What drives you yeah. to that? Mm -hmm. thing? Um, I I did consider working in Singapore for a while, or like. Uh, not not working in Greater China at all because at the beginning, like I struggled quite a bit, right? So, um, I, I was also thinking whether to work for the Singapore team because I was actually offered the opportunity at Facebook, but I decided not to take it eventually because I still kind of think that I want to challenge myself in a market where it's so foreign and uh, where it moves so quickly because, like, if we were to compare the pace at which China is growing as compared to like Singapore in terms of uh tech or in terms of like. I mean, just anything, right? Like China is just growing so quickly at a pace where nobody can really keep up with. So I would still prefer to seek that internet ex experience because simply because I can continue learning and disrupt myself when I'm feeling too comfortable in a place called home. Yeah, so I mean, at the end of the day, I'm still going to come back to Singapore and not going to be working there for a lifetime. So it's good to have that experience, but I would still want to come back to Singapore because like, I mean, for reasons such as like settling down and stuff. All right. Um, okay. Just a couple more questions, I think, from Cordelia. Cordelia was asking, and I think somebody else was asking the same question, but it kind of got buried. But I, I remember seeing this question twice, I think. Since you want to go back to the corporate world, you, both you and your co-founder, what would you say your exit goal or exit plan for an expert would be? Or do you have mm -hmm. actually an exit plan at this point in time? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. So actually right from the beginning, we have already thought of how we're going to exit um, the market or more like how can we run this in such a way that it doesn't require us to be working on this uh, full time. So we want, like I mentioned earlier, because of all the processes that we have built out, right? Um, one fine day, if we decide not to do this anymore, we can eventually like sell this to someone who wants to take over the operations and just run it on autopilot mode. So that is really our ideal state, um, at least for now until a new idea comes up or until like someone wants to buy us over. <laughs> yeah. So would Lily or Eileen, y'all would be interested to buy over? <laughs> um, our, our, one, of, one part of our business is to help cl uh, our clients build value in their business and to sell them. Yeah. So you, want to, so you should invest you should invest in an expert now, build it up and then help them go for IPO and cash out as well. Yes. Okay, um one more okay, one more question. Let's just take one more question and then uh you know, I think it's uh, almost time, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, from Ken, any tips on how to get a job at Facebook? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. So this is asked by a lot of to the HR. A lot of students. Uh, well, I mean, because of COVID, um, the, I mean, a lot of tech companies have also placed a hiring freeze. And to be honest, I think for Singaporeans to thrive in like tech companies, or at least, uh, I think the easiest way to get in first is to get into sales because that's 
kind of like you don't really need a lot of prior working experience to get into a sales job because you have to just learn the company solutions to, to sell to clients, right? So um, maybe brush out on Mandarin. <laughs> that, that's a good way to like get into the China market uh, because for Singaporeans, to be honest, we don't really have any like special skill set. I mean, not just skill set, but like special uh, a native language that we are strong at. So to get into this company is really about the right time and um, whether there's a fit in terms of what you can offer to these companies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that answer. I, I really like that because uh, I think getting a job, you know, is, uh, is both easy and difficult. But like you said, you know, the easiest way to anything is sales. Sales mm -hmm. is actually a very demanding job. Okay. Um, it doesn't pay well unless you work your ass off. Forgive the language, but that's what it is. Right. Um, yeah, thank you. So, all right. I just have one more burning question. How do you manage your boyfriend as a partner, as a business partner? <laughs> I knew baby was going to ask that like right from the start. You're just waiting to ask this question. Um, yeah, so I guess like for us, we like right from the beginning, before we get into this, a lot of people were advising us against starting a business together because just because we're in a relationship. So we've made it very clear that uh, whatever we do, we're, we're just going to discuss and we're going to divide and conquer. So because we have so many business units and things that we're working on, we just split them accordingly. So there's really like not much overlapping there to reduce like the amount of conflicts, of course. I mean, it's not normal if we don't quarrel, right? So there are some things that we do disagree on, but at the end of the day, it's really about open communication and trust in each other because um, we do not want the relationship to also take a toll just because we're in a business together. So we are quite mature in that sense where we, if we face any disagreement, we would want to iron things out like immediately and not drag it out because it would just be very unhealthy in that relationship. Yeah. Is your co-founder on the call as well? Is your co-founder in here? I need to verify. <laughs> and maybe <he> say <laughs> yeah, he's, he's on the call. Uh, but I, I don't think he wants to speak. <laughs> no, 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 but you know, it's interesting because as business partner, you know, when you start up, you're literally looking at each other 12 to 16 hours. And the fact that you guys are actually partners as well, right? Of course, you go back to your own homes and things like that. So, but I think you all will spend a lot more time than normal business partners. Mm -hmm, okay? Yeah, and for sure. You, 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 do you guys like kind of say, okay, when we go for a movie, let's not talk about work, which I think is actually not possible. You know, you can lie to yourself, oh, you know, when we, when we are out having a, a celebration, we don't talk about work. You know, you can yeah. lie to yourself and say that, but you know, when you're cutting your birthday cake, it's going to, hey, you know what, yesterday, what, you, you should have done that. And things like that will happen. Mm -hmm. so how do you actually manage really? Yeah, um, yeah, you I think we like do that. Party or you bring in your parents and say, come be the, be the judge of us or something. <laughs> it's definitely very hard not to talk about work at all. So we... Do, we are very cautious, conscious about it. So we do set like uh, certain time slots or like maybe weekends, for example, that we do not talk about work. But at the end of the day, it's so hard to avoid. So we, we just talk about it when we feel like it because ultimately this is our business. It's like our baby, right? So we have to make sure that if there's anything, we want to address it immediately and not like put it aside, especially since it's so important to us, like how we both left Facebook to start this together and we want to make sure that it's a success. So I, I don't think um, being in a relationship hinders like our work performance, but rather it also helps us to understand more about our strengths and weaknesses, how we can work together and how next time, like in future, um, we, I mean, if we are going to settle down, like, or when we settle down, how we, we, we can, you know, like work and live together with each other better. So it's still a good opportunity because when we're in Shenzhen, really like the only people that we have is each other. So it's really like Xiang Yi Wei Ming, you know, we left Facebook and this is what we're going to do. So we set our mind to do it and we make sure that we do it well. Yeah. Good, good. So are you actually at this point in time looking to take any interns or, you know, would you actually consider mid-career interns? Mm -hmm. Yep. So uh, yeah, I see a couple of people asking if we are hiring interns. Yes, we are. So uh, if you are looking, uh, you can talk to me uh, in a private chat and we can see whether right, there's yes. any fit in the company. Do reach out to yeah. Jermaine. Do reach out to Jermaine. Uh, you guys can actually reach out to OSG. We can pass you Jermaine's number if Jermaine's right for, for any legit questions, right? Any of this. Um, all right, Lily and Eileen, uh, we, we need to close this up very soon, okay? But uh, I shouldn't have said that because people start leaving. Uh. So I want everybody to stay <laughs> on. Turn on your video cam later, later, not now, okay? 
you know, you, I have to be fair. I have my video cam on all the while. So let's turn on the video cam later. But before that, Lily and Eileen, do you all have anything, um, you know, the last takeaway of this session that you want to share with Jermaine or share with the, uh, the audience as well? Should I go first? Yeah, yeah. So, okay. So for me, right, it's really when you're young or even right now, if you have a dream, just follow it. I'm very mesmerized by the Jermaine's sheer determination and drive. So all the best to you, Jermaine. Thank yeah. you. Lily? Yeah, um, like I said just now, I wish I was younger and I could uh, be here in China. I think China is such a wonderful place uh, and uh, Shanghai is a beautiful city to be in. Um, I, I think that uh, I could not get enough and that's why I've been here for my 19 year, years here. So I think um, I, I don't have any plans to go back to Singapore as yet and I'm sure uh, many of you will uh, be brave enough to step out of our comfort zone and come to a new adventure and I'm sure there will be great takeaway. Thank you very much. Okay, so Thank now you. if I may just requ uh, request everybody please turn on. Let's make this not any harder for anybody, you know, as long as there's one person who don't turn on the video, I'm not going to let y'all go. Right? <laughs> So just turn it on, you know, 30 seconds, we'll do a group photo so that we know who's attended, you know, and uh, put a face to the name so that, you know, we, in, in time to come, we will all reminisce this time during the COVID-19, you know, where we can still see each other, right? Connie Kwan, Lotus Lam. <laughs> see, I have to call out names. If y'all don't turn on, I'm going to call out names. Sophia Song, don't think I cannot see your names. I see your names and I don't see faces. I'm not going to end this. Right? Ryan Tan, James, Ken, Jonathan Kim, Felix, who is this? Holger, Ho Hojia, Hojia, Anna, Jotan. Names that are being called, please turn on your cameras. Right, Lily, you can just screenshot, screenshot. And Lotus, you are still not turning it on. I'm not going to Photoshop your picture in. Right, Lily, when you're done, let us know. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm done? Okay, sorry. All right, thank you, everybody. All right. Hang uh, on, hang on. I off, think the wrong Lily is responding. Give me a moment. <laughs> one more moment. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> well, we not have off already. Today. <laughs> okay. Very nice. All right. Um, okay, if you're just keep okay. Okay. stay on for a while, right? Next Thursday will be the finale or the final session of the OSG Youth Alliance Young Founders Series. We will have our last session next Thursday, June 11. Okay? I'm going to keep you all in uh, suspense, right? We will have a very interesting speaker, founder of a very interesting company. Right, uh, I can let you know we will have expert panels from Yakun as well as the US Embassy. Okay, we are going to have experts from these uh, places. So do join us again. Like I said, remember to go on to www.org.sg. Okay, you will be able to find updates on the next event as well as uh, video recordings of past events. All right, so do join us. And uh, here are the WeChat official account our account on WeChat, Facebook, Instagram, as well as YouTube. Feel free to follow us in any of the this social media that you are comfortable with. All right. And I'll see you all, I'll see you all next Thursday again. All right. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Ta -ta. Bye. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Jermaine. Thank you, Lily, Elaine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.